As our cities continue to grow, a combination of lifestyle choice and housing affordability has seen more people make the shift to higher density living. This is the Bottle Yard Apartments, located on the edge of Perth's entertainment precinct, Northbridge. One of the features aimed at encouraging interaction between residents is this shared garden space at the heart of the complex. For urban designer and researcher Anthony Duckworth, this was just one of the draw cards to living here. What's the role of shared spaces like this garden for people who live in apartments? Yeah, I think it's very important to try and form community when you're living in an apartment and to know your neighbours. Sometimes these spaces really help us to be able to form those bonds. The complex's manager, Henry Yi, also lives here and thinks the gardens haven't quite met their potential. I don't think any of us has the expertise to do it and mm. definitely need some advice, some, a lot of improvement, yeah. These are quite challenging conditions, growing on a concrete slab, so raised beds, limited soil, very hot microclimate, reflected light, yeah. heat. Henry and Anthony have put the call out, and I reckon if we can get the residents involved with the garden refresh, I can teach them the basics today so they can look after their garden into the future. What a great turnout. Good on you guys. OK, so here's the plan of attack. First up, we'll be pulling out the old plants and any weeds, as well as collect the stakes and things like that. Then we'll be removing the old irrigation, topping up with fresh soil and compost, putting in new irrigation and then finally planting up and mulching. Sound good? Good, right. Yep. Yeah. It's important to note that any major works involving garden areas within apartment complexes needs to consider things like weight loading and waterproofing to avoid future problems. These are obviously tomatoes that are well and truly finished, so these should come out, the steaks can come out. This is perennial basil, which, as you can see, gets quite woody, very strong scented, great for bringing around insects, particularly bees and other pollinators. But the flowers are so spent, it's time for a cut back now. I feel like I'm being quite ruthless. <laughs> this passion fruit vine is looking very ordinary. Normally what you should do is, after a passion fruit has fruited, give it a good cut back, and that will mean you'll get stronger growth and better flower and fruit the following season. It's also a grafted type, and the rootstock has started to sucker, which calls for some drastic action. We pull the whole thing out, OK? And in doing that, we get the rootstock up and those suckers, and then we'll refresh the soil and plant something else. If we don't, that will just get full of suckers and the bed will be hopeless. So now we've cleared the beds out. Next thing is, is to build up the soil, and you'll notice that it's really dropped down in some areas. That's because it's dried out and the organic fraction breaks down and you lose that volume. It's also really dry and, and pretty much dead soil. So we're going to add some fresh soil. And this is a combination of potting mix and compost. So it's got good drainage, but also uh, plenty of ability to hold moisture and nutrients. And it's teeming with life, of course, which is what plants need. So we're going to apply this to the point where we top the beds up so they're just beneath the timber edging, which is what these beds were designed for. So they'll take you know, quite a bit of soil to fill that up. And the idea is then just to sort of blend it through, just with your hands, with your gloves on, and just to incorporate it into the top sort of 100 mil of the soil. Good work out. <laughs> it is a good work out. And then once that's done, we'll also apply a small handful per square metre of this organic fertiliser for growing veggies and herbs. A lot of the plants that came out were never going to do well because of ineffective watering. It's an easy fix. The problem with the old irrigation system was that it was in one continuous loop, uh, which led to two problems. Firstly, it was looping around the outside, so the edges were wet but the middle was dry. And then also, being in a loop, there was no way to flush the lines if you get dirt and stuff in there, which is really important with drip. So what we're going to do is basically put a new arrangement in place. And I've done a demonstration here. So there's the original riser. And we just put in T-pieces and elbows 
to have these two lateral lines and they run like that and then just get pinned in place so they're nice and firm. And these drip lines have drippers at every 20 centimetres, so they give really good uniform wetting. And at the end, all I've done is bend the end over and put a piece of pipe ring on top. And that way, it remains sealed, but you can flush it out really easily. And then you can just even out the soil. The drip lines can just sit on the surface and they'll eventually be covered in mulch after we've planted. Perfect. Looking good. After a lot of cutting and connecting, it's the moment of truth for this newly minted group of irrigation installers. OK, switch on the valve, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> With the watering sorted, it's time to assign positions for an array of new plants that I've selected specifically for the conditions in this garden. The rhubarb, this will take a little bit of shade and doesn't like really hot conditions, so I reckon we pop this one over there. Globe artichokes in full sun, so down the back. In a garden surrounded by tall structures on all sides, properly considered plant placement is critical to give them the best chance to succeed. So when it comes to planting, really simple. They should just fall out of the pot, so a little squeeze. Never yank them, because you can damage them. And then, if they are a bit root-bound, just a very gentle tease, not much, just to sort of get it out of the root ball, and so the roots will then grow into the soil. And then, just where they were spaced out, so the spacing's nice and even, you just dig down, loosen it up with your hand or a trowel, and you want to plant the plant so the top of the root ball is level with the surrounding soil. Never too proud or it will dry out. Never too deep because you can smother it. And you backfill gently and with your fingers just push in and melt the soil between the outside and the root ball. And then last thing is just make a little basin at the bottom. So when we hand water it in, water directs to the roots and that will help establish it. Next, a layer of mulch to keep the soil cool and to retain moisture. We're applying 50 millimetres of shredded lupins which will need to be topped up as it breaks down and feeds the soil over time. A thorough watering in, and these plants are already settling into their new home. Here's two, cheers. cheers. Well done. It's a great result at first glance, but the real test of this garden success can only be measured in the long term. It will rely on continued TLC from these folks but the early signs are promising. If there's any repair work, any maintenance, most of us can do it now, yeah. I'm hoping that people will continue to be involved and will build stronger community over time. The people I've had a chat to, um, who I've either never seen before in the apartments or faces that I've sort of seen across the hallway, but you know, now we've actually had some good proper conversations, got to know each other as well, which is really nice. The old saying, many hands makes light work, certainly rings true here. I mean, have a look at it. Through collaboration, these guys have totally refreshed their productive garden, and they'll soon be reaping the rewards. In fact, you'd have to say, they already are.